15 years of writing letters, actually answering real questions from real people around the world. And then uh, Remnant Publications wanted to publish another book for me, and we compiled all of that into a book. And it is a very comprehensive resource, actually. Um, at my latest one, uh, well, you can see these banners behind me. We had these banners made for the general conference where we were going to launch the new book, um, and then for ASI. Uh, but both of those events got canceled, so I'm stuck here with the banners. So I'm using them. <laughs> I am using them as backdrops. Um, for my presentations right now. By navigating the storms of contemporary sexuality, identity, and love is the name of this new book. And it's, uh, it's designed to address some of the uh, false messages that are being circulated throughout the church today regarding the LGBT issue, uh, messages of love and acceptance and, um, and dialogue, but nothing about sin and overcoming sin and and uh, transformation of character. And so th these types of books that are being circulated now uh, within the Christian church are giving people false hope. It's making them feel good, but it's not leading to uh, genuine conversion or transformation of character. So I was contacted by people from every level of our denomination wanting my feedback on this and our ministry feedback on these other books because they didn't seem to really be according to the gospel and biblical. So uh, in the end, I wrote this book to basically um, address the very same issues as the other books, but from a biblical experience, guided by the word of God, by the voice of, uh, of by true science and, and uh, research, and by the voice of experience and reason but mainly guided by the word of God. So this is a very biblical approach. And if it's biblical, friends, you have to know that it's a message of love because God is love and the Bible is the word of God. So a biblical presentation on this subject, we must understand is a message of love, compassion, but without compromise on the biblical principles. Uh, so anyway, I uh, to just, I wonder if I can do a short version of my story uh, rather than give you the whole book tonight. Uh, no, just kidding. But uh, yeah, I, I have not always been a pastor and I've not always been a Christian. Uh, I, I was raised one though. I was born and raised in a Christian family. And can we do screen sharing? I have a PowerPoint that can go along with my testimony. If we can do screen sharing, am I able to do that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the whole, okay. Um, because I can give some illustrations so you don't have to just look at me all night. Um, and yes, you can uh, go ahead now. That, that, gets, that gets boring after a while. Uh, also, I'm seeing myself and that gets boring after a while too. Um, let me know when it's ready. But, you know, yes, Revelation it is, it 12, is ready. 11. It is ready, Ron. You can go ahead. Is and it share. ready? Yes. Okay, then I'm going to um, see if I can move this over there and, and here. Well, oops, better not do presenter view. I'm going to let me do slideshow. Uh, I think that'll work better. Okay. All right, uh, I can find a little icon, here we go. Revelation 12, 11 uh, tells us that we overcome him, meaning Satan, that old serpent, the dragon, uh, the devil and Satan, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. And so, you know, I used to wonder about that text, but then I realized that we're told biblically that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. So that means Satan himself could tell the story of Jesus probably better than you and I can. He's been around a long time, but, but he uses truth to deceive. And that is very, uh, a very cunning practice that he has. Uh, 
you know, because he doesn't use the whole truth and nothing but the truth. It's kind of like Abraham. Remember when Abraham said, she is my sister. Well, that was true. But it was, it was actually it was only half true because she was a half sister. But it wasn't really even half true because there was a, another relationship that was much more intimate than being a sister or, or half sister. She was his wife. But uh, Abraham used this method to deceive. He told the truth about something, but he withheld the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Satan does the same thing. And so he can tell the story of Jesus probably better than I can. And, you know, his ministers, we're told, as ministers of righteousness, and they can do the same thing and lead hundreds of people to the altar, weeping to give their hearts to Jesus. But what is the word of their testimony when they're confronted with um, questions like, well, what about the law of God? What about the Ten Commandments? And then these very same people that can give a very emotional and heart-melting um, rendition of the story of Jesus will say, well, you don't have to worry about the law. It was nailed to the cross, and, and God loves you the way you are, which is not true. He loves us in spite of the way we are. Um, if he loved us the way we are, then he wouldn't be trying to change us, would he? So, uh, but they, they use elements of truth and lead people astray. So the, the text of Revelation 12, 11 says we overcome by the blood of the lamb. Yes. And by the word of our testimony, you see, Satan doesn't have a very good testimony. He cannot testify to the love of God, uh, the power of God to transform a life from sin to saint, uh, sinner to saint. Uh, and these ministers that, that urge people to just not worry about the law, the word of their testimony is a false test. Um, it's a false gospel. So it's very important that we understand that to overcome Satan, we share the story of Jesus, but also we, we share what he has done for us. And uh, we demonstrate uh, as well as say what he has done for us. And so Every one of us have a testimony. You know that, don't you? Every one of us have a testimony, and it is the most powerful message you can present. So let me launch into mine. <laughs> My father was a dairy farmer. And we, were, we started out in, in young life working on uh, uh, living on this big, beautiful farm, uh, actually down in Mississippi, where dad ran the dairy. Uh, but at that place, when I was only four years old, I was sexually molested by a farmhand that was working my father. And I have to tell you, that totally derailed me at the age of four. No four-year-old child is mature enough to process sexuality. He's not mature enough physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. And so it can totally derail him mentally and emotionally because he's not equipped uh, to handle such things, but uh, many children, uh, we, we see in the world today, many children that are sexualized, they think sexually, they talk sexually, they act sexually when they're very small, very young. That's a sure sign that something has happened. They have been introduced to sexual behavior because it does not come natural before, I would say, before hormones kick in at the time of puberty. Uh, up until then, you know, we boys think girls have cooties and girls think boys have cooties. And, you know, we, we're, we find it yucky to think about kissing the opposite gender uh, and, and things like that. That's all yucky stuff to children. Uh, but when the hormones kick in, those, you know, things change. But if a little child is thinking in these terms long before puberty, that is, to me, a sure sign that they have been violated or conditioned or uh, somehow exposed to sexual behavior to where their young minds now think in those terms. And in my case, uh, at that young age, I was out of control. I mean, I couldn't control my thinking at the age of four, but I did know that what happened was wrong. I did know, I did have a sense of right and wrong, even though I'd never talked to my parents about sex. I mean, why would I? But I knew what had happened was wrong, and I would not tell my parents a thing about it. I never told a living soul what happened to me until I was, uh, until years later when I was in my mid-20s. 
the first time I told a living soul what happened. So I grew up dealing with this issue, not processing it properly. And it grew in my mind like a, a nasty boil until eventually it finally erupted. Uh, but being derailed at that young age, then I developed some emotional problems and even some physical problems, loss of control when it came to uh, my bladder. Um, and my father thought that I was just being lazy. And so he began to punish me every time I had an accident. Uh, that drove a wedge between us because I wasn't being lazy. I, had, I didn't have control. And I grew up with that, and the, wor the more I was punished, the worse it became. And it was because my father had no idea. He, he did not understand, and I grew up not understanding him, and, and I grew up without him understanding me. And so we grew apart from a very young age to the where I actually even grew up hating my father because he was so abusive, perception he was abusive towards me without reason. But I was, uh, uh, the next year, when I was five years old, I started playing the piano and taking piano lessons. And I, I took off with music, but where I was growing up, the little boys in the community thought that that was sissy stuff. And so they began to call me names and because I played the piano rather than wanting to, to rough house outside. I'd be called sissy and they'd say, why don't you just go play with the girls and things like that. Uh, so I grew up troubled, timid, confused, and I found in music um, an escape. And uh, actually, I found through music that I did uh, find more and more acceptance uh, as I grew up. Be and by the time I was 12 years old, I was a church pianist. And so it kept me involved in church. And I was a very spiritual child growing up. Even though I was very troubled in my mind, um, I found that music gave me a sense of acceptance and attention that I was lacking. I didn't feel loved or accepted by my father and, and ridiculed by the boys. I was alienated from my own gender. And maybe you can see what I'm talking about here. Uh, and this is really quite important that when, when a child is being called names and bullied, if he's being called gay or queer or faggot, that is negative um, reinforcement. It is a brainwashing to where that child will start wondering, are they right? Am I? What is it about me that's so different? And, and it actually pushes children in the direction that they're being called when they really had no inclination to go there in the first place. Um, but what you find in the gay community is a very accepting community. It seems it's very accepting. Uh, well, they're, for one thing, they recruit and they're always looking for something new, something fresh. Uh, they, they, like a, they like the innocent, they like the naive. Um, and, they, and so a person that is being bullied in one segment of society can find a parent acceptance and love and everything he's missing in the gay community. Uh, so I was very vulnerable. I grew up very vulnerable. Uh, I was repeatedly molested while I was in grade school by an old student. Um, yeah, when I was just a young boy, um, there was a, a high school boy that I looked up to. He was a little bit older than I was, but um, he befriended me and I admired him and I enjoyed having a friend, but then he ended up sexually abusing me many times while I was, um, while we were in school, not school but during that period of time. So once a victim, I would say it's very easy to be victimized again. Uh, I didn't know how to say no to the point that even when I was drafted and I was in the military, I was repeatedly taken advantage of and not knowing how to say no or to stop sexual abuse um, because I'd been programmed from a very young age. But still, I was spiritual. As, as long as I was a victim, it didn't affect my spirituality. But uh, I loved church. I loved the Lord. Uh, I wanted to be... Um, 
very involved in church. And while I was in the military as a surgical technician, I was stationed in South Korea. And while I was in South Korea, I got involved with a missionary group from La Sierra College that were teaching English in the very first uh, English language schools in the Orient. Uh, when I was discharged from the military, I joined them. I wanted to be a part of their group. I was playing the piano for their Sabbath school and church services every week while I was still in the military. So I got very involved with them. And then I joined them to become a teacher myself uh, before going back to college. I had actually dropped out of college in my sophomore year because I, I couldn't afford to go to college. And so I was out for two years in the military. And then I spent two years as a student missionary teaching in South Korea and in Thailand. Um, and I really enjoyed mission work. So when I finished my time as a student missionary, two years in the Orient, I decided that I would go back to college now that I had government funding, we call the GI Bill, um, I could afford to go to school. And I determined to go back and take theology so that, and pre-med so that I could train to be a doctor. I'd be trained in ministry and medicine so that I could go back overseas as a missionary, full-time missionary, as a medical missionary. And that was my dream and that was my goal. So I went back to Southern Missionary College, which is now Southern Adventist University, and enrolled in theology and pre-med and pursued my education. But even then, though I was a very spiritual person, I think this is another important point for you to understand, I was plagued by my same gender or same sex attractions. Um, I, it just haunted me because from the early childhood, I had lost control of my mind to where I, I grew up with wild fantasies and uncontrollable imaginations. And so by the time I was a teenager and then a young adult, I had years of habitual thinking in the wrong direction that I just didn't seem to be able to control. And I decided, you know, if I'm going to be a worker for the Lord and be a, a missionary, a medical missionary, I have to get over this. I had not willingly involved myself in any sexual behavior up to that point. I was just plagued with it in my mind. And so I came up with what I thought was a perfect solution. If I were to just get married, I thought, that would take care of all of my sex drive and my sexual attractions. And so I, I thought that marriage would be the solution to my problem. I don't know how many of you on this um, on this program tonight are married or are not married, but I've seen some pictures, so I think some of you are married. And I would venture to guess that those of you who are married would agree with me that marriage is not the solution to problems, right? <laughs> and so those of you who are not married, listen Agreed. to those of us who are. Do not think of marriage as a solution to any problem you will find in marriage problems you never imagined before. It can be the beginning of woes if you're not married to the right person for the right reason, with a blessing of God, and with the right chemistry. So, did everyone get that? <laughs> anyway, I married a friend, a, a, a student missionary that I had worked with in the Orient, and she was a very uh, nice young lady, and she loved me, and I don't know that I knew how to really fall in love. I was trying to, uh, I liked her as a friend. I loved her as a person. Uh, and it turned out to be a terrible mistake. But I mean, I chose to have a Christian wife, to have a Christian home, to make Christian babies, <laughs> to have a Christian education, to train to be a Christian missionary, and all of those things. Uh, but... I soon discovered that I had made a terrible mistake and I was afraid that I was going to end up being a big disappointment to my wife because marriage only compounded my confusion because it did not carry my same sex attractions, which surprised me. And so now I had all of this complication. I was married to a woman and attracted to men. And, um, 
and it really made it much more complicated than had I stayed single. But I tried and I prayed a lot about my situation that the Lord would just take this gay thing away. Maybe some of you have heard of people doing that, praying that the Lord would just take the gay away. Well, the Lord doesn't promise to take the gay away. Remember the apostle Paul, he prayed repeatedly that the Lord would take something away. He called it a thorn in the flesh. Well, my thorn in the flesh was the homosexual attractions. And Jesus eventually said, Paul, you know, uh, and it's my paraphrase, of course, I'm not taking that away. My grace is sufficient for that and for you. So Jesus doesn't promise to remove temptation. He promises to give us strength to overcome it. People say, um, have you ever been tempted since you were a Christian? Have you ever been tempted that way before? And I say, listen, I was baptized on February 7, 1992. Satan wasn't, if you get my point. I chose a different direction for my life. Satan didn't change anything. He didn't change his uh, direction for my life or his behavior. So I can't control what Satan throws at me, but I can control what I do with it. But I didn't understand all of those things at the time. And so as I prepared for graduation, don't be laughing at my senior picture, but anyway, um, I was given a call to ministry and I, I turned down the call to ministry because first of all, I realized I didn't have answers to my own issues and I had not gone to medical school yet. You know, I was graduating with pre-med and with theology, but I was going to go on to, pre, uh, to medical school. So I turned down that call to ministry. And uh, one thing I did not do is pray about it. I just turned it down because I had in my mind, I'm going into medical missionary work. So that I suppose was a great mistake because I never did go to medical school. Um, I'm not a, a, a doctor today. I'm a minister, a pastor. So maybe that was God's plan A for my life, and I thwarted it. Um, and I'm sure I've thwarted many of his plans for my life over the years. I'm probably on plan Z now, uh, or maybe I've started over with double A. I don't know. But uh, when I turned down that call ministry, it's almost as though I turned away from God if you understand what I'm saying, because I didn't pray about it. I had stopped praying about the Lord taking the gay away because he wasn't taking it away, and I got upset with him. I, it seemed like an exercise in futility, so I stopped praying about it. And so, not long after my graduation, I fell from grace. I was married I had a, a little girl that was two years old and another one on the way, uh, another little boy on the way. And I finally fell into homosexual behavior and, uh, and I was just mortified at what I had done, but I was honest with my wife and I told her, uh, I, I told her my situation. Of course, she was shocked. She was devastated. I remember she was a Christian. She loved me, and she was not willing to give up on our marriage. And so she urged me to go with her to counseling and, um, and see if we couldn't work through this. She was willing to work through it to save our marriage. She had married me with the idea of being a minister's wife and missionary. And, um, and so you can imagine her world came crashing down, even as mine did. We went to counseling together. But I'll tell you, when I was growing up in the church and going through school, there was no discussion about homosexuality. There were no resources that I knew of. There was no one I felt safe talking to. And especially after going to counseling, because the counselors would, uh, in the end, counsel my wife and say, you know, Mrs. Woolsey, you need to just divorce this man. Get on with your life. That kind can never change. Well, when I heard that, imagine my feelings about the counselors, about God, and about the church. 
we went through a divorce and I went into the world bitter, angry against God, the church, pastors, everybody. If God could not save me from homosexuality, then he was impotent in my mind rather than omnipotent. And if he could, but he chose not to, then it was all his fault. So you see, either way, I had a, a skewed picture of God at that point. With a degree in theology, I had a lot of knowledge, but if your knowledge of God is not in the right spirit and with a converted heart, it can be a very dangerous thing. And I used my knowledge of theology to silence anyone who questioned my behavior because um, they would talk to me about choices. And I'd say, no, 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 I chose to be married. I chose to have a Christian home, to have Christian babies, Christian education. I've made good choices all my life to be a missionary. I didn't choose this. I just finally accepted who I am, who I really am. I didn't realize that I was just, <laughs> I was just, um, I'm doing my own argument at that point because acceptance is a choice, isn't it? Uh, I accepted who I felt I was born to be. Well, I went into the, into the world labeled as unchangeable and I became unreachable, humanly speaking. I wouldn't go anywhere, talk to anyone, read anything, listen to anything, watch anything that had anything to do with religion. I was done. Maybe, maybe you know someone like me at that point. What do you do? How do you reach the unreachable and change the unchangeable? Well, I'm here to tell you that, that God is the one who specializes in reaching the unreachable and changing the unchangeable. And so let me just share with you how the Lord worked. This is a, a very important part of my testimony, and it really is what I like to focus on. I don't get into details about my gay life. I mean, what good is that? When I tell you that I went into the gay world that's all I need to say. Let's talk about what God did to bring me out, okay? I had, my parents uh, had become very strong Christians. They loved me unconditionally. Uh, this is my father uh, at that time. This was right after I went into the gay world. And my father and my precious mother, and they loved me unconditionally. They prayed for me without ceasing. And, uh, and I didn't know about all of that, but they did not give up on me, their prodigal son. They demonstrated their love in many ways. They, they never could afford much to travel, but I moved all the way out to California and they were still living in Mississippi, but they found a way somehow to get out to Southern California almost every year where I was living as a gay person um, to spend time with me in my home they loved me, they loved my friends. The little boy in the red shirt that you see on the screen is my son that was born at the same time I left the Lord. Um, but uh, anyway, as I was living that life, my parents uh, went to great, uh, took great steps and went to great effort to spend time with me, loving me, loving uh, my friends. Uh, but we never felt condemned by them, but also we knew that they did not condone our behavior. So that's kind of a fine line to walk there, but that's the way they were. They loved uh, unconditionally, but they did not condone our behavior. And I think that's the way Jesus operated too. He, uh, he had great compassion, but he never compromised his own principles. So my parents um, were very influential in in my life uh, at that point, uh, as I was in that condition. Here's some more of my family, uh, my brother and his wife, my sister, my little grandmother, my parents. Um, I found out they all prayed for me without ceasing, that the Lord would do whatever it took to reach me, to bring me back. I was the prodigal son out in the world. And so uh, whenever my parents would come and visit, uh, those are two things, uh, if you want to know how to reach the unreachable, love them unconditionally, pray for them without ceasing, be a, an intercessor. But my parents also became, I, I say they became forgetful. And I say that tongue in cheek, but um, every time they would leave me, leave my home in California, they left something behind. Um, 
And for example, uh, after they had left one time, I found this big, beautiful Bible under my pillow in my bed. Now, they knew that I was unreachable. They couldn't give me things because I would refuse them, but they could leave them behind, all right. So there was a big, beautiful Bible on another trip. They left a whole nine-volume set, Testimonies to the Church. On another occasion, the five-volume series, the Conflict of the Ages series, you know, with the Desire of Ages, the Great Controversy, all of that. Um, they left a book called The Stemption. There was the Steps to Christ. You can see what they were doing. They kept leaving these things behind, and, and I knew they were tokens of love, so I had no heart to throw them away. I just collected them all of those years. For many years, I collected these books they kept leaving behind, and I refer to this as my Left Behind series because they kept leaving these books behind. Uh, and But this Left Behind series proved to be very helpful and very biblical. Um, whereas the others, well, we know about the other one. So eventually, you can see what the Lord was doing through my parents. He was, he was putting all of these resources in my home because I wouldn't go talk to anyone, read anything, you know, go, go anywhere that had anything to do with religion. So then finally, the Lord took the matters in his own hands. And I remember uh, that in his intervention, this one night I had this horrible dream in which my life was passing before me. And I'll just flip through some pictures of my life at that time. It was not my whole life. It was my life that I was living at that time. And um, it was, uh, I was a dancer and a dance instructor. That was in my dream. Um, I, uh, I did a lot of inline skating. I did a lot of partying. Uh, I was a hang glider pilot. I spent time in the mountains flying my hang glider and um, also uh, did a lot of bicycling. But then also there was work. But what I'm showing you this for is to show you that my life was so full of activity that the Holy Spirit had a hard time reaching me. And in that dream, all of these activities were in that dream, just from one activity to another. My life was so packed with everything then I had no time for the Lord. In fact, with television, I'd come home from work and turn on the TV, and I had one at the foot of my bed, and I would leave it on all night while I was sleeping, so in case I woke up, I wouldn't have to get up to turn it on. I was a TV addict. Um, I was drowning out the voice of God in all of those situations. But then in that dream, suddenly the scene lit up, and I up only to see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory and I was lost. I'll tell you, friends, it was a horrible, horrible nightmare. Uh, the, the coming of Jesus should have been a wonderful thing to experience. But no, as a lost person, I was like what you read in the Bible, uh, the wicked calling for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them from his face. That's the terror that I felt in that dream. It startled me awake. And I sat there in that beautiful darkness not no longer facing Jesus. And I remember saying, thank God, that was just a dream. I was so relieved that Jesus was not, Jesus was not coming because I was lost. So I worked to go back to sleep. And then the next day went about life and forgot all about it. And so wouldn't you know, sometime later, the Lord sent the same dream again. And I say the Lord sent it because friends, I had that dream. It became a recurring nightmare for over three years. Now, that's, that's the Lord intervening in my life. He was messing with me, I might say. He was working to interrupt my journey because I, um, I was not reachable any other way. And so eventually I came to my senses to a degree and realized, you know, I've been blaming God for everything wrong in my life. Um, up to this point, and I'm still lost. Blaming is not helping anything. Blaming is just self-justification. It's everybody else's fault. It's God's fault. It's not my fault I'm the way I am, but I realized that blaming was leaving me in that same lost condition, and so I, I realized I need to stop blaming. I need to face myself. I need to really investigate why am I the way I am? And I went back through my life and I started reviewing all the ways that I had been derailed and uh, victimized and conditioned to be where I was at that time. And I realized, you know, 
I wasn't born gay. I used to say I was born gay. I wasn't born gay. I was conditioned to be gay. My parents weren't gay. Their parents weren't gay. Their parents weren't gay. Where would gay come from? And science shows there is no such thing as a gay gene. It is not genetic. It is conditioned to behavior. Many, many factors that play into it or can play into it, but it is not something you're born with. And I just started logically thinking, if, if God condemns this behavior, surely he's got a way out of it. Why, why would a God of love condemn homosexuality if he didn't have a solution for it? That wouldn't make sense. So I decided to find the solution. When I was in college, I was studying to answer all the questions of the professors. And I had stopped studying for myself. Uh, but now I had no professor to impress. I, was, I decided to study for myself and see if I couldn't find the answers to my questions, not the professor's questions. So I went to my Left Behind series and I pulled out that big, beautiful Bible and I opened it and I tried to read it. And I couldn't read that Bible. My mind was mush from being a TV addict. So I put the Bible back, but then I saw that little book. I thought, well, I could read a little book. It's big letters and short chapters and it's a skinny little book. I can read this one. Of course, it was Steps to Christ. But I started to try to read that book and I couldn't do, I couldn't read that one either. I could not concentrate. I could not focus. And so I did something that I don't recommend, but I'm being transparent and this is what I did. I decided if I'm going to read this book and find my answers, I've got to relax. So I went to the kitchen and I came back with a margarita. I sat down with my margarita and then I lit up a cigarette and then I picked up Steps to Christ. And that's how I started reading the word of God, drinking and smoking and turning to page one, Steps to Christ. I know there's something wrong with that picture. And on page one, I had to stop and talk to the Lord about it and say, Lord, I didn't leave you over cigarettes. I didn't leave you over margaritas or alcohol. I left you over, you know what? Let's deal with that first. You show me the answers to this issue and then we'll come back to the alcohol and cigarettes later. And I continued reading while smoking and drinking or I continued smoking and drinking while reading, either way. Uh, until I got to chapter five and in chapter five, I came across the most amazing material about uh, God's plan for my life. And I'll just, uh, I'll just summarize real quickly that his plan for my life far exceeded anything I could even imagine for myself. Uh, I was being very foolish because everything God asked of his children is for their own good, their own well-being, for their health, their happiness, their eternal life, uh, for quality of life and length of days. And I, I found that in chapter five of Steps to Christ, the chapter on consecration. So I highly recommend reading Steps to Christ and especially that chapter five, it was transforming. It was life changing. At that point, I found myself snuffing out a perfectly good cigarette, if you know what that is. Um, I couldn't do that anymore while reading the word of God. I found so many wonderful answers. If any man be in Christ, you do eternal things are passed away. All things are become new, which simply means the new birth consists in having new motives, new tastes and new tendencies, I read. And new tendencies of all things. And a genuine conversion actually changes both hereditary and cultivated tendencies to wrong. I'll tell you, friends, there is power in the word of God, recreative uh, power. But just to race through, because I know I'm running out of time here, uh, reading the word of God did work to change me, to change my life. I realized that that I did not have to be identified by the nature of my temptations. People say, well, if you're, if you're tempted with gay thoughts and, and so forth, you're gay. No, it, Jesus was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. We don't identify Jesus by the nature of his temptations. We identify Jesus by the nature of his behavior and his choices. His character is not based upon his temptations, but how he met those temptations. And I started learning this, that Jesus suffered being tempted. So who was I to say 
if God is not going to remove temptation, then I will have nothing to do with him. Jesus suffered with temptation. If I'm going to be like Jesus, then I'm going to be tempted too. Being Christ-like, friends, means you're going to be severely tempted, and you may suffer with temptation. You may struggle with temptation. Jesus resisted unto blood striving against him. All of these amazing things I studied, and I won't go into to everything because of the amount of time, but eventually I reached the point where I wanted to follow Jesus. Now, I had a problem because I was in a gay relationship. We loved each other very much. How was I going to get out of that? Well, just to simplify it, uh, to simplify it, I learned to love Jesus more than my gay relationship. And when you love Jesus more than your sin, then you can step away from your sin. It's difficult, but you can do it because you are now you really are following your heart. <laughs> you know, the world says, follow your heart. Well, don't follow your heart unless it's converted. Uh, follow Jesus. And so Absolutely. I made the choice to follow Jesus. Uh, and uh, in the process, uh, my friend turned on me and almost killed me um, because, uh, you know, Satan is not willing to let you go easily. But I was able to escape that, that life. I turned and walked away, never to go back. And immediately I felt a call to ministry. And I'll tell you, I was so shocked to feel that, that mental, spiritual call to ministry because of the life that I'd lived all those years in the gay world, but I couldn't escape that nagging call. It was like the call of Jonah. Jonah, you know, was in the belly of the whale three days, three nights. I had that dream for over three years, but then that's kind of prophetic, a day for a year, isn't it? <laughs> but immediately after leaving the gay life and moving away from my environment to get away from that scene and to find refuge here in the beautiful Ozark Mountains of Arkansas from L.A., um, I was able to hear the still small voice of the Lord and I felt called to ministry. And um, what gave me courage was reading about the demoniacs when Jesus delivered the demoniacs. He said, now go home to your friends and tell them all the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. And I thought, well, I can do that. So I wrote out my testimony in a short letter and I mailed it out to everyone I knew thinking, well, I'll just do what the demoniacs did. I'll tell everybody about my conversion. Two weeks later, I got a, a phone call from my best friend from high school. We had left the church at the same time, opposite directions, but equally degraded. And he said, Ron, I'm reading your letter again, uh, and I'm really impressed with what you, what you have decided to do. And he said, I think it's time for me to come back too. And he did. And my letter had a lot to do with his reconversion. And he became a pastor and uh, down in Florida, and he's been there ever since. Um, so he was called to ministry too uh, when he came back to the Lord. And I see, I saw immediately how the Lord could use me in ministry by the word of my testimony. So I gave my parents a copy of the testimony to read. My dad took it upstairs and he was reading. And, and then I heard him chuckling as he was reading my testimony. And I thought, why is he chuckling? Why is he laughing? This is serious stuff. And then I confronted him about that. And I said, uh, dad, why are you laughing? And he said, well, right here, you wrote, the Lord gave me rest day nor night. So I said, well, dad, what's so funny about that? Why are you laughing about that? It's true. This is serious stuff. And that's when he said, Ron, for 16 years, your mother and I prayed that the Lord would give you no rest day nor night. There is our prayer on page one of your testimony and our answer as well. Um, my father was laughing for joy that I had come back to the Lord and he could see the answers to his and my mother's prayers there on page one of the testimony. So I realized that following Jesus, I could bring joy to people's hearts rather than breaking their hearts. And so I began to pray more, Lord, if you want me to be in ministry, then you, you'll have to make it happen. But I'll commit like William Miller, wherever I'm asked to go, I'll say yes. I don't know how I'll get there or whatever. You make the way, I'll go. And um, then I began to add to the prayer. 
And I asked if the Lord would bless me with a double portion of his Holy Spirit uh, if I were to be in ministry, that I might redeem the time I had wasted all those years in the world. And I still wasn't getting any invitations to go anywhere, but I hadn't been baptized yet. I was still struggling with those cigarettes, and I didn't want to be baptized until I had the victory, until I allowed the Lord to give me the victory over that, because we're to bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. And, and I didn't want to be baptized until I could be baptized a lot cleaner than I was at the time. So in the meantime, I continued preparing through prayer. And then I, I remember praying, would you ever, Lord, trust me again with family? I gave the Lord permission to lead me in a totally opposite direction, restore in me the manhood that he had created me with, make me a family man. I mean, if he wanted to, uh, I asked if he'd trust me with that. And then I, I also asked if he would restore the gift of music I had squandered over all those years in the world. I had been a dancer in the world, not a musician. And I had been trained in church music. And uh, so I had squandered that gift. And very quickly, here's how the Lord answered those prayers. The very night I was baptized, I was asked to preach the very next weekend. I eventually quit smoking, got baptized. February 7, 1992, a preacher was there and he came to me and said, would you preach at my church next Sabbath? Friends, that was 29 years ago. And I've been in a pulpit ever since. Uh, since the night I was baptized, the Lord was just waiting for me to make that public declaration and make that public commitment and then launch me into ministry. Um, so uh, I've been in ministry these 29 years. Then um, a year later, I was uh, involved in a camp meeting here in Ozark Mountains of Arkansas there was someone gossiping about me that had heard something about my past and hadn't talked to me about it, but he was gossiping. I call this the gospel according to gossip, and here's why. He was gossiping with malicious intent about me, but the gossipy, the one listening, was not paying so much attention as to what Ron Woolsey had done in his life, but what he was hearing was that God could save someone like Ron Woolsey. And after hearing all the gossip, he came to me, this other young fellow, and he gave me a puzzled look, and I didn't know what he had heard, but he looked at me and said, man, Pastor Ron, if God can save you, he can save anybody. And I was quite surprised at that. And so then he told me what he had heard, and I said, oh, well, that, yeah, well, maybe some of that's true, maybe a lot of it's true, but it's not all true, but, but what is true is that, yes, God can save anybody from anything. This is kind of my one of my mottos that God is love. Nothing is impossible with him. He is mighty to save the whosoever's from whatsoever, even to the uttermost. He specializes in reaching the unreachable and changing the unchangeable. And so this young man said, would you baptize me at the end of the camp meeting? Now, I hadn't trained or, or studied with this young man. He actually was already a Christian. But when he heard of the power of God to change someone like me, it was like new light. And he wanted to be rebaptized with a new commitment and a new understanding of the love and power of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? And so at the end of the camp meeting, I did baptize him and about 12 other people. And as I was turning to leave the baptismal tank, the, the pool, then I heard a commotion in the water behind me. And I turned and there was my father standing there, fully dressed, an elder in the church was saying, Ron, baptize me too. And I thought, why? <laughs> but it's not a good idea to argue with your dad in a baptismal pool. So I, I baptized him, understanding he wanted to recommit his life to Jesus too. As we were, he was very emotional and he said, uh, I asked you know, what that was about. He said, I, I want what you have. I want the Holy Spirit working in my life the way I see him working in you. That was an answer to prayer, wasn't it? Answer to prayer number two, that the Lord was indeed blessing me with his Holy Spirit in ministry. Um, at that camp meeting, there was a young lady that I had known since childhood, um, and she had lost her husband, and she was there with her, her son. And by the end of the camp meeting, she had agreed to go with me on a date. Now, this camp meeting was October 22, for a reason. Um, 
Two weeks later, we went to our high school homecoming as a date. And while there, my sister went along as a chaperone. <laughs> um, and my sister came to me one morning and said, last night, Claudia said something I probably shouldn't tell you, but she did anyway. She said, Claudia said to me last night, I don't know what your brother is up to, but I wish you'd hurry up. Well, this was our first date, but I had known her since she was a child. So I hurried up and two weeks later, I had her come back to Arkansas for Thanksgiving. And uh, while she was here, I took her for a nice walk in our beautiful Ozark Mountain Forest. And I proposed to her, asked her if she would marry me. And she started laughing. Well, I wasn't prepared for that. I was, I kept hearing hurry up, so I did. But no, she started laughing and then she said, Ron, I always knew you were slow, but I never thought it would take you 30 years. I've been in love with you since the eighth grade. So <laughs> that was her way of saying yes, I guess. Um, and six weeks later, we were married. We had our wedding on New Year's Eve. Um, that was the two of us on our one and only date before, before uh, the proposal and before getting married. So she called just before the wedding and said, Ron, there's a marimba set up here at the church. I want you to play for our wedding. Well, I balked at that, but she insisted and I showed up the day before the wedding and I picked up the four mallets and lo and behold, I could play that marimba. And for our wedding, I played the Lord's Prayer, uh, Bless This House and some other songs and um, the Lord restored that gift of music, um, apparently instantly. And I have been using that gift in ministry ever since. Uh, it's become a very powerful uh, part of my ministry to do music as well as message. And just to show you that, that um, uh, this was our, our wedding night there in Nashville, Tennessee area. So the Lord answered all of those prayers. Uh, he put me in ministry. He uh, blessed me with the Holy Spirit. He restored, he gave me family. He restored the gift of music. Two years later, he was still answering the prayer about family. And we had a midwife visiting, found out that my wife was pregnant. They thought we were going to have twins. Uh, my wife looked at me uh, very seriously and said, Ron, it's time for you to stop praying for those second chances and double portions. We were in our 40s and she was not prepared to have twins. But a few months later, Zachary was born. He was not a twin. Uh, that was a false uh, alarm, I suppose. 19 months later, Natalie was born. She was not a twin either. And this was our family a few years ago, Zachary and Natalie. Uh, 19 months later, my wife was expecting again, but uh, she got very ill during that pregnancy and it terminated the pregnancy and we lost what turned out to be triplets. But we expect to raise those triplets in heaven. I think we have good indication that we can be raising our departed children in heaven if we are faithful. But there's, there's my family. The Lord has been so good uh, to us as a family, my, our son and daughter, this was at a high school banquet uh, at Oklahoma Academy, where they went to academy. Uh, my son, as he's preparing for graduation from college a year, a uh, year and a half ago, um, and my daughter there. Uh, so this is my stepson and his little boy. And the Lord has just been really good to us. My oldest daughter and uh, her son in the red graduating gown there. My wife and my daughter were pregnant at the same time. So my grandson in red and my son, Zachary, are the same age. I think that's quite interesting dynamics there. And uh, this is my oldest son uh, living in California and his little family. Uh, the Lord has been really good. Uh, my stepson in the middle and our two younger ones there as well. Uh, and then uh, this is us. Uh, several years ago, actually. But the Lord has been very good. I uh, wanted to close with this uh, picture of my parents. My father had a massive heart attack right after I went into the gay world. They gave him five years to live. 
if he had surgery, five years to live if he didn't. So he and my mother went to Uchi Pines, got involved in the health message, and the Lord gave him 35 years instead of five. That's seven times five. And the last 20 years of his life, he lived, he and my parents, my parents lived next door to us here in the Ozark Mountains. He turned out to be my closest, dearest friend and most avid supporter. My mother is still living and she's now 93. My father lived to be 90 when he was supposed to be dead at 60. So the Lord gave him 35 years instead of five. The Lord is good. Well, oh my, I'm looking at the time. Leon, what do we do? You wanted some questions and ans uh, an answer period? Yes, don't, don't, don't worry about the time. Don't, don't worry about the time. You can, um, yes, but we can have questions and, ask, and answer, sorry, at the end, of course. Um, but um, you can take your time in wrapping okay. up. And, well, uh, let me do the Q&A. <laughs> one of the things that, um, that, oh, by the way, I would encourage you to read this passage of scripture uh, for, from 1 Timothy chapter 1. The, this, the letter that Paul wrote about his own ministry, and I apply that to my own because Paul was, he was, it's like he was marveling that the Lord would accept someone like him into ministry because of his past, his blaspheming, his persecuting, his murdering, and all of that. And he says, you know, for this reason, uh, God put him in ministry. It says here, uh, that Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, he said. And here it is, he said, because I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should be uh, hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. The reason I like to close with that uh, passage of scripture with my testimony is because I've been challenged a number of times about what right do I have to be in ministry with the life I lived in the past? And I said, well, you'll have to bring, take that up with the Apostle Paul when you see him in heaven, <laughs> because, um, because it was the Lord who called him into ministry and the Lord who called me into ministry. But what happens uh, through people like Paul and, and even like myself, an extreme conversion simply reveals an extreme God. Extreme love, extreme compassion, extreme mercy, and extreme power. So the Lord delights in converting in these extreme conversions because uh, it demonstrates uh, in a, an extreme way who he is, not who I am. So I, I really like that passage of scripture, 1 Timothy chapter 1. I encourage you to read that and, and really think about that. Uh, but, you know, Leon, you had um said something about uh, well the myths and facts and yes. i mean i have a whole presentation on that but let me just say that that the christian church has uh has been confused about a number of issues for many years for many decades i suppose because they did not understand the difference between what is true and false regarding the gay issue and so I have a study called Myths and Facts regarding this. That is that is another presentation, but let me just say that uh, some of the myths are that, that a gay marriage is very similar to a heterosexual marriage. It's no different. Um, that, and yet science and research and surveys show that, that in, gay, in the gay culture, there's extreme uh, promiscuity. Um, some some people have uh, some people have as many as over a thousand sexual partners in a lifetime. That's nothing like gay uh, like straight marriage, is it? There's extreme uh, promiscuity. Uh, another myth is that that gay marriage is perfectly safe and healthy, uh, but research shows. That sexually transmitted diseases among the gay community are 43 times that of the heterosexual community. There's a, there is a very high incidences of disease and violence and of um, 
death and substance abuse, all of that. And another myth is that people are born gay and science does not back that up at all. Uh, very recent research from Johns Hopkins University uh, shows that, that there is no gay gene, that it is conditioned behavior. Um, and so people wonder, well, where did the concept come from? Because we've heard about it all our lives. Well, back in 1985, these two political gay people, one was a, a psychology major and the other was uh, a politician. Um, uh, see, one, yeah, one was in politics, the other was in psychology, and they got together and they decided in order to get minority status, they wanted minority status for the gay community. And in order to do that, they needed to convince the world that people are born gay. Why? Because to get legal minority status under the Civil Rights Act of the 1960s, I think it was, you have to be a community that is persecuted and you have to be unable to do anything about changing those circumstances and the gay community could check off those two boxes. But the third criteria was uh, that you had to be born that way. Well, up until then, that was not uh, believed, but they decided we'll have to convince society that it's something you're born with. And that way we can get legal minority status. And so they wrote books, they got the media involved and their method was to repeat that idea uh, is free, very frequently, very loudly, um, very broadly to where it would become believable. So now, you know, whenever we have a question and answer period, so I'm, I'm answering a question that I know would come up <laughs> in, in a question and answer period because we get it everywhere we go. What about those who are just born gay? Well, they're not born gay. Science doesn't back that up. That is that is all a political hoax uh, that the gay community came up with in, starting in 1985. That's 35 years ago in order to get special privileges as a minority uh, with through minority status. Uh, but, you know, we could share all of this information with people that think that they're born gay and they may still insist, well, that they were born gay. So what do we do with that? And this is a part of the questions that Leon that you Listen, what do we as a church do with that issue if someone thinks he's born gay? Well, Jesus said, be born again, right? <laughs> Everyone coming to Jesus is invited to be born again. So why wouldn't the gay person do the same, right? It, it's, a much, it's simple, isn't it? It's a simple concept. So Jesus says to the gay person, if you think you were born gay, then so be it. Your perception is your reality. But I invite you just like I invited Leon and like Carrie and Kareem and Wendy and KB, who have, have, you know, I'm looking at these names here. I invited them to be born again. I'm going to invite you to be born again and join the family. We, everyone needs to be born again. Isn't it a simple concept? Yes. Uh, yes. Again, it, it can be a traumatic experience. Yeah. I don't know how many of you remember when you were born, but. When I was born, I came out screaming, especially when they were slapping me on the behind, you know? It's a traumatic experience to be born. And so being born again can be a traumatic experience. It can be very, very challenging and very difficult, but the thing of it is, it's doable. Uh, and, and everyone coming to Christ goes through that. The fourth myth that I wanted to mention was, uh, you, you may have heard this, once gay, always gay. We hear that all the time. Once gay, always gay. I wrote a tract saying, can born a gay be born again? <laughs> um, and it's a very, it's a pocket track version of my testimony. Yeah. But if once gay, always gay were true, that means no one could ever be changed. What does yeah. that say about God? Yeah. Would that not declare him to be impotent because he is the transforming power? So how many people does it take to refute that myth? It only takes one. To one yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. If one person can be transformed from gay, then it refutes the myth. So that's why, friends, our ministry 
meets so much opposition. Because when we are testifying to the power of God to transform our lives, uh, and I've been, my wife and I now have been married for 28 years. We have five children. We have grandchildren. I've been in ministry for 29 years. Do you think the people that preach once gay, always gay appreciate my testimony? No, no. no, because it refutes their myth. And so we get all kinds of opposition. They say, oh, you never were really gay in the first place. If you're married and you have children, then you never were really gay. Think about how silly that is. Who is going to live 16, 20, 40 years of gay pretending? Does that make sense? Oh, I just pretended to be gay. Yeah, right. If you're <laughs> pretending to be gay, you're going through all that gay behavior, you're gay. <laughs> it's that simple. <laughs> you cannot pretend yeah. to be gay. Mm. So it's a silly argument. But you know, friends, I hear this all the time. Oh, you never were really gay. Well, then uh, you were always straight. Well, it, it, it's a very silly um, response to someone who has a testimony. But that's really all they have because they don't want to accept the power of Jesus to transform the life. Um, another question you had here, Leon, uh, yeah. you wanted me to talk about the concept of love versus hate. Do you yes. realize that those of us who are preaching the love of God are accused of hate speech? Now you, Leon, in Canada, should yeah. know this very well. Because yes, definitely. <laughs> when, when we... When we have been in Canada, we are, um, we are slandered as spreading hate. There's nothing hateful about the gospel. The gospel is a message of love. Being transformed back to the image of God that he created us to be in the first place, that's not a message of hate. So the world is being turned upside down with this, this concept. In fact, there's one... Uh, fairly well-known gay Adventist. I say that tongue-in-cheek because I don't know how you can be gay and Christian because it's like oil and water. It's an oxymoron to me. Um, but he's put together a list of things that Christians should not say if they want to communicate with gay people. Because if we say, go and sin no more, that's hate speech. Who said that? Who originated that statement? Wasn't that Jesus? And isn't Jesus, doesn't the Bible say God is love? So the words of Jesus are now being branded and labeled as hate speech. We are not to say that homosexuality is sin because that is hate speech. And on and on and on. There's a whole list of things we're not to say. But the Bible talks about how things will be turned upside down in the last days. Good will be called evil, and evil will be called good, and, and so forth. Friends, that's where we are. Um, and we do have to be very careful about how we do speak of these issues, because uh, gay people tend to be very sensitive. I know. I were one. <laughs> uh, gay people, in my observation, having come out of that community, they deal all of their lives with a perception of rejection. And that makes them extremely sensitive. But this sensitivity has just gone overboard now because if you have a difference of opinion, then you are a, a promoter of hate. We see that in the political world, don't we? I mean, what's going on in the United States right now is just shocking that a person can have a difference of opinion and be hit over the head because he's wearing a red hat. Uh, you know, that, that's crazy. There's, there is no tolerance for a difference of opinion. Um, it takes two to have a difference of opinion, right? You can't have a difference of opinion by yourself unless you're schizophrenic or bipolar or have dual personalities. It takes two people. Why is one's opinion hate and the other's not? And generally, the ones crying hate are the ones that are most hateful. Um, so uh, we're dealing with very strange things here. So we do have to realize 
that with the LGBT issue, there's an extreme sensitivity because of this perception of rejection. And so their thinking has gotten to be, if you don't agree with me, that's not nice. In fact, we'll call it hate. And I, I mean, that's dangerous and hate can lead to violence. And so we've got to have laws to protect us from the violence. So we have to have laws protecting us from your opinion. That's what it boils down to. So these hate speech laws are really a silencing of the freedom of speech. And it's a way of bridling the gospel. So you cannot share the gospel of love to someone who thinks that your, your gospel of love is really a gospel of hate. So we do have to be sensitive to that. We need to be very compassionate in our approach with gay people, but without compromising on the word of God. Now, that may sound difficult, but that's the way Jesus was. Remember when Jesus said to Mary, neither do I condemn you. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Yeah, neither do I condemn you. The gay community loves that. But in the next breath, he said, go and sin no more. Well, that's hate speech. So how yeah. can you, you know, there's no reason. There's no reasoning with that kind of thinking. <clears throat> So we can be very compassionate without compromising. In fact, yes. true compassion will not compromise. If you're compromising on biblical principles, you're loving people down the broad way to destruction rather than up the narrow way which leads to eternal life. I call it a cheap love. You know, we've heard of cheap grace. Well, to me, that's a cheap love. Yes. It's a love that doesn't want to be bothered. Oh, I'll just love you the way you are. God loves you the way you are. That's not biblical. Because he says, be ye transformed. Mm -hmm. So that means he doesn't love you the way you are. He loves you where you are. But he wants to lead you to a better place. He loves you yeah. in spite of the way you are. He wants to transform you into a better person for your own health and happiness and fulfillment and well-being and eternal life. Um, so I'm just touching on these points. Uh, what are Christians doing now in their responses to the community that are harmful? Well, one thing is we don't want to use the Bible like a, like a ball bat over someone's head. We don't need to be telling people they're going to hell, right? We don't need to tell people they're going to hell. The Holy Spirit can do a lot that we can never do. We're told that the most powerful argument for truth is a loving and lovable Christian. Yes. And so when we deal with this issue, we don't want to condemn people because that can turn them away. We want to woo them. We want to draw them to the Lord through our loving uh, attitude. And loving them doesn't mean you condone the behavior. Yes. Uh, Jesus loved us while we were enemies, while we were strangers. He didn't condone our behavior. It, like he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Um, so that's, that's one thing. We have to be careful. Uh, I know some people ask us, how, how do I approach my son about his homosexuality? Or how do I change this person or that person? And we need to remember that Jesus himself said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these yeah. things shall be added unto you. In other words, you don't need to approach a gay person about his homosexuality. That's going to drive him away. Approach him with the love of God. Yeah. Lead that person to accept Jesus first as a friend who loves him and then as a savior and the Holy Spirit will lay a lot of conviction on someone that's developing a relationship with the Lord. And yes. I've seen many times that in my situation, no one had to tell me that homosexuality was going to, where it was going to lead. I knew what I needed was an intimate relationship with Jesus. And as I developed that relationship with Jesus and learned to love him more than my sin, then through the prompting of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God, which is transforming power, I was able to walk away. But I had to develop the relationship first. In fact, that was yeah. quite a lengthy process. Um, 
I mean, I was loving the Lord and very strongly convicted for the whole last year that I was in my gay relationship. Uh, but it took me a long time to get to the point where I had the courage to break away. So what we need to do is, is just like bring people to an evangelistic series, uh, you don't hit them with the mark of the beast on the first night, do you? Or, yeah. <laughs> or even the state of the dead. You de help yeah. them to help them see the love of God, and it's a loving Father who will reprove you, correct you, instruct you, and train you. It is a loving Father who will warn you, a loving Father who will even punish you. In every one of our doctrines, we need to encase them in the love of Jesus and, and, and show them how this doctrine is re related to the love of God. Yes. And that's what we need to do as a church. Now, your last point was, how can we respond and evangelize to this community in a truly loving way? Oh, I think I just kind of covered that. Yeah, what do you I think, Leon? Are you okay? <laughs> Yes, that was a that was an excellent summary. Um, um, I apologize I'm, for sending um, extended questions, but um, <laughs> you did all. I'm trying to cover job. five sermons in one night. <laughs> I know, and it's I know. Hard to do. You, you made you laid you laid a job on me, <laughs> but it's okay. But it's okay. Our apologies for that. But um, that was that was a wonderful. Um, way of, of summarizing and i'm sure that there are a couple of questions so do you have um uh, a few moments more minutes more for a few sure. questions okay so sure. um a friend of mine asked a question i don't know if he wants to go ahead and to ask it he asked me privately to ask pose it to you um perhaps i will try to see if i find the question no where is it okay um the question was along the lines of um that it is often said that there is a gay agenda you know that's a phrase that is very often used um the person was asking do you believe this is so and if it is so what is it <laughs> i think you kind of touched on something like that before well what a neat question i mean i haven't i've i thought i'd heard every question there was possible to ask but that's that's a new one but it's easy to answer Yes, of course, there's a gay agenda. And I just touched on it. In 1985, the agenda was normalize homosexuality. Let's get everyone believing in something you're born with, that it cannot be changed, and that way it can be normalized. And, um, and we can be integrated into society, fully accepted, fully, uh, fully um, well, let me just say it this way. In my lifetime, I have seen homosexuality go from uh, from asking to just be tolerated uh, to being accepted. And once they were accepted, then they wanted more. They want to be um, celebrated. And so now you have Gay Pride Month every year. Um, you mothers get Mother's Day. and You fathers get Father's Day. And those of you who are not married or with children, you get Christmas Day, <laughs> you know, uh, but the gays get a whole month, Gay Pride Month. But are they satisfied? No. From celebration, they want to be uh, legislated, uh, silencing speech, any opposition, uh, and they want to be glorified. And that's where they are today. It's glorified. You know, homosexuality, I heard someone refer to it as the experimental drug of this age. People are experimenting with it because it's a taboo. And if you put something off limits, try that with a little kid. Tell him, don't stick your hand in that jar. What's he going to do? First thing he's going to do is run over there and stick his hand in that jar. If you had never said anything, he wouldn't have even looked at the jar. But you tell him don't, and he's going to go do it. That's the way the human nature is. And um, so homosexuality has been taboo for thousands of years. But now that it's being glorified, people are experimenting with it. There are television programs now where, where straight people engage in gay behavior, um, just saying, well, I'm being open-minded. And uh, 
but they don't realize that once you experiment with it, how highly addictive it is. But what is the agenda? Um, in my presentation on myths versus facts, I have several testimonies of prominent gay um, politicians and journalists saying that their agenda is to do away with marriage. Now think about it. Why? Who, who do you think hates marriage and family the most? Because in marriage and family, there is procreation. Satan covets that ability that man, mankind has. He cannot procreate. And in procreation, we participate in creation. Satan cannot create anything. He, he can only destroy what is created. But God has given mankind the ability to create, to procreate something Satan himself cannot do, and he hates it. And so he's out to destroy it. Now you think about, this is from another sermon. I have a whole bunch of sermons, but anyway. I call it the devil's test run. Two institutions created in the Garden of Eden, sacred ones. Marriage on the sixth day, Sabbath on the seventh day. Satan is doing, he's testing the society today. If he can successfully redefine marriage through legislation on a global basis, then he knows he can successfully redefine Sabbath through legislation on a global basis. Do you get what the gay agenda wow. is? They are now openly stating that they want to redefine marriage and do away with the archaic institution of marriage uh, altogether. I mean, I have the quotes and the pictures of the people who are stating this, very prominent gay politicians and journalists. That's their ultimate agenda, to do away with a sacred institution in preparation for Satan to do away with the second sacred institution, which is Sabbath, which will be the final test for God's people. So right now we're living in the time of the test run for the final um, assault on God's law, the, seventh, the fourth commandment. Uh, I just did a whole sermon in five minutes. Um, <laughs> usually Thank you. Thank you for that. usually takes me an hour to do that one. <laughs> but you get the point. Yes, there is definitely a gay agenda. And I don't think they realize themselves that they are pawns in the hands of Satan to push Satan's agenda. But it is a gay agenda. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, now, yes. now let's do a time check. Uh, right. Let's do a time check. Um, and because we need to take some questions, uh, not sure how much time does Ron have with us. I know he needs to go, probably spring another server. <laughs> well, I see, I see Nikki's hand. You're but... afraid I'm going to preach another sermon, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, right, no. So we, have, yeah, yeah. we see one hand from Nikki, and we'll take some other, maybe another two or three hands. Uh, yeah, so we don't want the other persons with questions, please, go, uh, please go ahead and raise your hands, and then we'll take them after Nikki, and then we'll wrap. Okay, Nikki, go ahead. All right, good evening, and thanks so much for that testimony, Ron. It was very deep, very deep. Um, I, I happen to work in an area that focuses on sexual and reproductive health. And very often, I, I engage persons who are part of the LGBT community. What I find is that there's often this push for us to embrace the community and try to help to integrate the community into, into society. But as a Christian, as a Seventh-day Adventist, I find that my role is to provide a service to the individual who comes in for health care. And the space doesn't necessarily provide me with the leverage to have that kind of conversation, maybe a biblical um, conversation, but I think where as a church we need we need to do more is to facilitate this kind of of presentation where we can hear from individuals who have come out of the community. I've gone to workshops um, to to sit and listen to 
persons of trans experience talk about all the different things that are happening and what we need to do to encourage them. And I've listened to Christians in the same setting bash and tear down. And very often the responses coming from Christians tend to be very, very weak in terms of how to answer. One person in particular, I must share this, um, a, a, a very loud advocate here in Jamaica spoke about our view of sexual sins. And that as a church, generally speaking, the church tends to focus on um, homosexuality as the worst sin there is, while at the same time, we have a lot of issues with other sexual sins, mm -hmm. right? And, yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah. and, I, and I, I'm wondering, how do we respond to that? That's one question. How do we really engage our members and secondly, I want to affirm the point you made uh, as it relates to um, the, the, the prevalence of certain diseases um, among um, persons of that lifestyle. Because, and I know the person aren't observing what's happening on television these days, most of the antiretroviral ads that we see on television, it's usually um, a gay couple that is involved and engaging the audience to say, hey, try this new ARV and, and all of that. So we are seeing mm -hmm. that. I see it firsthand in my, my workspace. And I think we need to begin to look at how we engage the community in a non-discriminatory way, right? While still maintaining our message. But please, if you could give us some insight as to how we can practically engage the community without i mean i know we can't really get rid of offense we will offend some persons no doubt but how can we begin the conversation uh it's very good points that you're making there as you heard me say earlier when i was growing up in the church there was no discussion about these issues no resources uh, no one we felt safe talking with and one of the focuses of coming out ministries is to inspire the church with our testimonies. So you know that this is something that can be overcome like any other sin issue. Uh, so inspire, then enlighten. We want to educate the church, just like what you're saying on, if you understand what the difference between, excuse me, the difference between what is myth and what is fact, that's very important that the church understands the difference that they have the truth on these issues so that they don't have to give weak responses. Excuse me, they can they can speak with authority, with knowledge, with understanding. So our ministry is out to educate the church um, uh, through enlightening the church. Um, then also we want to um, equip the church. Uh, so we have a lot of resources now. I mean, I've written three books. We have a number of DVDs. We have a documentary, Journey Interrupted, um, very professionally produced documentary. We have pocket tracks. We have all kinds of, of resources to equip the church to do the very things you're asking about. You can find these on our website, comingoutministries.org. Right, uh, right. But the very, fact, the very fact that we're talking about this issue, see now, more and more gay people see the church talking about the issue. That is a giant step in the right direction that we're discussing it because we weren't discussing it when I was growing up and people like me floundered because we didn't know where to go. We didn't, we were afraid to say anything because uh, I was the only person in the world that had these feelings. I didn't know of anyone else who did. So, you know, we, uh, when the pandemic is dealt with, <laughs> we like to go to churches, and we do all over the world. We go in this very thing. We inspire, we enlighten, we equip, we, we have the dialogue. And so when you have a church full of people at one of our presentations, I generally ask, how many of you know someone who is gay or LGBT or struggling with the issue? Basically, every hand goes up. Now, I know that there's probably someone in that audience who is gay. And so I speak to that person. 
not directly because I don't know who it is. But I say, you know, if someone here is gay, look around. These people are here because they love you. They are here wanting to know how to relate to you better. You look around and you see that this church that is full of people for this seminar are here because they love you and want to help you and relate to you and learn how to better um, uh, help assist you. So this church is talking about the issues. So you don't need to be afraid to, to approach someone with the burden that you're carrying. Let them know because this church is here to help you or they wouldn't be here listening to our seminar tonight. See what I'm saying? Um, when, we, when we have our seminars, there are gay people that come, and I'll tell you, they afterwards, they come to us directly, and they will now talk openly because they feel safe, that they can express their, their burdens and their issues without feeling condemned uh, and ridiculed and mocked and slandered or shunned. Uh, so that, that's what I'm trying to put forward, that the church needs to invite gay people to come to your church. Now, membership, we have to realize, is sacred. I'm not yes. talking about membership. I'm talking yes. about evangelism. Yes. And when they come to your church, don't hit them over the head with the gay issue. Yes. Uh, <laughs> let them see the love of Jesus. Help them develop that relationship with Jesus. And as they feel comfortable coming to your church, the sinners are mingling with all the other sinners who are there. <laughs> they realize, this is where I need to be. Yeah. I can learn in this place. I can grow in this place. I will not be condemned in this place. And I can talk to people about my issues and they can talk like they talk about theirs. Now, if someone comes with the agenda that we were talking about and they're wanting to promote homosexuality and they are defiant and resistant and are flaunting their homosexuality, that's a different story. Those people need to be asked not to come back because you have to protect that flock from any error, from any source. And if you see the church coddling people who are promoting homosexuality in the church, you're gonna lead your own young people down the wrong path. They're going to think, well, the church is okay with it. It must be, you know, I can go that way too. So you have two kinds of gay people, just like two types of sinners that will come to church. There will be some who are looking for family looking for a home where they can learn and grow and be transformed and there are those that come in that want to change the church in fact the material that uh, that is being promoted now in our own denomination unfortunately is called posture shift have you heard of it posture shift is an it's not an adventist approach but these seminars are being conducted with our ministers all over the north american division trying to teach the church how to change its position rather than the sinner change, having a change of heart. And mm -hmm. I think it's a travesty that we're trying to get the church to change its position on gay behavior and embrace it rather than helping the gay person have a change of heart. It's a totally opposite approach. And that's why I wrote the book, you know, as you see behind me, Navigating the Storms, because our approach is to help the sinner have a change of heart not the church have a change of position. Wow, right. excellent. Um, okay, so we see a hand um, by Martin, this is Martin, so we'll allow her to go ahead. And um, and if there are any other very quick comments thereafter, then we'll take those, but, um, but then we'll give it a wrap. And then- My turn. Oh, sorry, somebody was unmuted. Okay, go ahead, um, it's Martin. Uh, um, obviously, it's not Mrs. Martin. <laughs> I'm using my wife's profile. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> That's cool. Um, I have a question. Is it that we are saying that no one who is not a victim of sexual abuse or molestation in, in the early stages can develop same-sex attraction? Because... I think I'm going to be honest and don't accuse me of having an agenda. <laughs> but over the past year, I've been giving this issue a lot of thought. And I have come to the conclusion that I think we, as a denomination, have somewhat oversimplified the issue because there are 
people who have gone to NCU, that is our um, Adventist university here locally, to study theology, and Nick and me know this, because he's an NCU alumnus, um, who have, I can count at least three of them who have gone to NCU to study theology specifically, and they have left, and they are now practicing homosexuals, gay, you know, married, two of them are married. So, I mean, is it that all gays who are walking around have been molested at some point, or is there the possibility oh. that, 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 that they can inherently just have this attraction? Because when you, when you try to advance the argument that homosexuality is learned behavior, they will ask you, who taught you to be straight? So shed some light, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very good question. And when I was talking about the sexual molestation, that was my experience. Uh, my colleague, Michael, was never sexually molested. <clears throat> he was raised with a mother and three sisters and three uh, cousins. Or, or, they're all women. His father was absent, uh, was not around. And when he was around, he was angry. He was rough and abusive and so forth. Uh, but he was never molested. Now, we don't know all of the factors that lead to it, but we know it's not genetic. There's, there's a scientific research that shows it's not genetic. For example, uh, one of, just one example of the studies is that of identical twins. That's been going on for decades, and I have, uh, I have research on that. Uh, and what, what they did, they would they would find a gay person who was an identical twin and they logged the concurrence that the other twin was also um, so you know in studying the identical twins for all of these decades you would think that if there was a genetic component that both would be gay if one is gay the other would become the same dna pattern and uh yeah but the concurrence is only 7.7%. That's extremely low. Uh, you may have one identical twin who is gay and the other is totally straight. So um, that study in itself has debunked the born gay theory, but that's only one type of study that's been done. Uh, another thing is a person that is sexually molested does not necessarily become gay. Uh, I say they, they can be derailed. In other words, you we have met women who tell, testify of being sexually molested when they were young or in their young years. And, and one of them may have become a lesbian where the other one turns out to be highly heterosexually promiscuous. Uh, and, but then there are those who own it all together and grow up to be, have normal lives. Uh, the thing of it is, Satan doesn't care which side of the road you fall in, which ditch you fall in. He comes through like a freight train and he'll knock you off the track. And if you fall to the left or fall to the right, it doesn't matter. You're still off the track. And so if you grow up being heterosexual and highly promiscuous, that's okay with him. If you grow up being homosexual, that's okay with him. The point is, you have been derailed. Um, and so we, I like to use the illustration of taking also a lump of butter and a lump of clay. And you put these two things out on a concrete sidewalk in the sun. One lump is going to melt and the other lump is going to harden and become a brick. <laughs> Uh, when exposed to the sun. And people are that way. Some incidents will harden a person and that same incident will break the other person. Uh, so where Satan is concerned, he doesn't care. Just He's the destroyer. And he doesn't matter which way you go. In my first book, I listed all of the abominations I could find in the Bible. And I, it was mentioned earlier um, that we in Jamaica, you were saying, they look at homosexuality as being this terribly, like almost an unpardonable sin and overlook other ones. When you list all of the abominations in the Bible, adultery is an abomination, just like homosexuality. They're both a violation of the same commandment. 
uh, you put all of those abominations together in one paragraph, it will blow your mind that homosexuality is no more ab an abomination than a lying tongue. They're both abomination or gossip or cross-dressing. Certain remarriages are considered to be abomination. Uh, things that we think of as very insignificant, a proud look, you know, pride. We don't think of it as being so bad, but it's also abomination. When you take homosexuality and you put it in the basket of sins, like every other sin, then it doesn't lessen the significance of it. What it does, it, it, it gives you the sense that it's just as redeemable as any other thing, any other sin. There's hope for the homosexual. Um, in fact, in my study, I, uh, uh, in that chapter, I say, you too can be made whole. It doesn't matter which abomination you've been addicted to, you can be made whole. So, uh, and then one more thing on the, the cause of homosexuality. The Bible speaks of the mystery of iniquity. We can't label every factor. One factor that I am very aware of, every gay person I know of, deals with that perception of rejection. Yeah. And people that feel rejected will go where they feel accepted. They're longing and starved for acceptance. Uh -huh. And uh, so this perception of rejection can lead people into drugs, into alcohol, into, <clears throat> into prostitution, heterosexual sex, homosexual sex. It doesn't matter. That perception of rejection is very, very, uh, very harmful. Uh, but when you speak of, when the Bible speaks of the mystery of iniquity, we can't always identify the cause. In fact, the Bible doesn't spell out the cause of bondage to sin. The Bible focuses upon the solution. And that's what we need to do. Uh, you can spend your life in self-analysis trying to figure out why you are the pervert that you are, you know. <laughs> when you finally get it figured out, then you can justify being a pervert. Uh, and that's, that's not what self-analysis should be about. Uh, and it's okay to, to research your history and try to figure out, did I get derailed here or there or whatever? But the bottom line is focus on the solution. Uh, and there, a person, a child can be sexualized simply by observing someone having sex, like on television, uh, being exposed to pornography, uh, hearing a conversation, Hearing, the, hearing little boys talk about this new game they want to play. You drop your pants, I'll drop mine. You know, that type of thing. And so children can be so easily um, uh, influenced in the wrong direction by all kinds of factors. But no, we cannot identify every possible factor that conditions someone to be gay. And the Bible doesn't expect us to. The Bible focuses on the solution and that's what we need to really focus on. Absolutely. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> I'm sure it was, absolutely. Um, the, I saw another hand, um, which would have taken perhaps as a last question very quickly, but the person put the hand back down. So maybe they'll join us um, in, our, in, our, in our discussion afterwards, in our after study, after we are off live. But, um, but thank you, uh, Ron, for, the answers that you gave, uh, responses that you gave, I really appreciated them. And I'm sure that those who pose the questions equally appreciated the responses. Um, uh, Kason, well, uh, I'll go over to Loy or yeah. to you. Just to Loy, we'll just go straight to Loy. Okay. Hi, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, Loy. Can't see you though. I wonder if you're hiding. <laughs> <laughs> not quite, not quite. Um, okay. But um, I wanted to thank Ron. Well, on behalf of everyone, Ron, thank you for just coming out tonight and spending the time with us and sharing your testimony with us. I am sure that someone listening was blessed. And that, you know, someone will leave here tonight just feeling that much closer, knowing that, you know, there is really nothing that is too hard for God. So thank you so much, Ron, 
for coming out and spending your time with us tonight. And we look forward to having you around again and, you know, just um, learning more from you and spending some more time with you. So thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Loyan. Uh, uh, just, just in closing out, uh, we, we've said all that we can say. We, we didn't get to touch all the questions, but we're just going to ask uh, Ron to just close out with prayer. Uh, then we'll go to our after study segment. Okay. Father in heaven, I thank you for this time that we have had together this evening. Uh, you have told us that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, and I pray that the word of my testimony has, first of all, been to your glory and your honor, and secondly, that it has been a benefit to someone or everyone that has been on this uh, program this evening. Uh, well, I just thank you for the privilege of having a testimony, and um, pray that you will continue to work in my life and help me to be an overcomer, and that you'll be the, do the same for everyone that's listening tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Ron, for just blessing us with your presence. I know we said it already, but we just want to thank you. <laughs> thank you again for all that. Um, yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you for having thanks. me. Right. Please say thanks to your family as well. Okay. Wish you all a happy Sabbath. Please thank and, you so um, much. Maybe we'll meet again along the narrow way. Which yes. leads Absolutely. To life. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for connecting us with Kizia and the others as well. And we'll be having a few other presentations yes. during, the, during the series. Thanks to you and to Michael. Uh, thanks for your kindness yes. and for reaching out and, um, and being so willing to cooperate uh, with us and to come on and to share. So we will talk again and I'll be, I'll be talking to you on the WhatsApp. Okay. Good night, everyone. God bless. Right. Good night, Good night everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. All right, everyone. So we just before we cut the live stream on Facebook, we just want to thank those persons who were viewing on Facebook. We thank you for being with us. Um, we is it on speaker view? Yeah, but for some reason something is on. Uh, but we will definitely, um, we are definitely using this opportunity to invite you to next week's presentation and discussion and study. Um, we will be having um, another guest and also uh, dealing with a similar topic, but a very interesting topic, actually, uh, aspect of this topic. Um, and then on the fourth, um, my audio is lower. Wow, I wonder why. And then on the 4th of, um, of December, we will be having, as you saw on the, on the poster, uh, Kizia, or Kizia, I think her name is yeah. from August, uh, Chisholm. And born she's also from Coming Out at Ministries and that caption will be born again and she'll be talking uh, from another perspective as well within the remit of the same subject. Uh, so we are happy that you joined us. Uh, Beautiful Ashes, it promises to be wonderful. We'll be having many great uh, discussions, studies, presentations as we go forward. And we really appreciate your company and we look forward to seeing you next week at the very same time. We'll be starting as uh, sharply as we started this evening, 7.30. Um, yeah, so, we, just want to remind, we just want to remind others as well then, because you're breaking up, we just want to remind them that on the 11th, we're having Dr. Walsh with us again um, on the 11th, Surviving Babylon. And then after that, we have a very special treat for our Time Science members because we'll be looking at the testimonies by Neville Peters, um, Testimony Trading uh, Spaces, uh, and it will be a musical presentation largely. So you can't afford to miss that. Uh, so we just want to ask you to stay tuned, keep connected. And as you know, as well, we'll put our email address there and just put an email address there in the, in the, on the box, uh, timesigns at gmail.com. Um, you can send us your questions, your comments. Time signs 2011. <laughs> time signs 2011, sorry. Time signs 2011. We appreciate all your emails. We'll give you feedback. And yeah, it's there in the chat room. Uh, for those on Facebook, I'm not sure if Trish or Cynthia can type that in as well. Timescience2011 at gmail.com. Thank you so much. I just want to remind you that with everything we're doing, because we know that it's high time to awake out of sleep. 
So happy Sabbath night. Yeah. Um, bef before you do that, Leon was breaking up a lot. Um, I didn't hear what's happening for next week. Can you repeat that, please? Okay, so we said uh, next week we have Kizia Chisholm. Uh, she's also oh, from- Kizia, Kizia is the following week, sorry. Next Kizia week is the following week. Say again? Kizia is on the fourth, Jason. Yeah, Kizia is next week. Yeah, because next week we should be having a special guest next week. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we will put that out in the poster um, that will be coming out in the week. Yeah. But this is, a, this is yeah. under the very same theme. Yeah. Um, but it's, it promises to be very interesting. So just look out on the Facebook page, etc., for yeah. that particular so, promotion. Yeah, so just covering that, as Trish, Trish asked, we'll be covering a special guest next week. On the 4th of December, we'll have Kizia Chisholm, Boring Again. And she's also from Coming Out Ministries. Uh, the 11th, Dr. Walsh, and the 18th, Neville Peters. Just standing, just correcting that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Bye, Facebook. See you next week. Bye, Facebook. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello, Lawrence. How are you doing? Happy <laughs> Sabbath. <laughs> give him praise, man. Looking, looking well, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think I saw, I saw a crystal um, in the chat as well. Yes, uh, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, for your, thanks for your company. Yes, yeah. man. Yes. Hello, <laughs> Lawrence. Um, yeah, it's yeah. Sabbath. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> my... <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, we didn't get to touch all the questions. Um, Martin, Martin Clark, Mrs. Martin Clark. I saw you. I saw your. Your hand up, you didn't get a chance to um, verbalize when uh, Ron was here, but you can get the chance now to talk to us. Just go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, man, I, I did speak, you know. Remember, oh, you not okay. Okay. Oh, I, I, I was, oh, I, I just saw Mrs. Martin. Oh, the hand was still up. Okay. The hand was still yeah. up. All right. No, man, um, I, st I still have the follow up. <clears throat> Oh, 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 okay. Go ahead. Okay. The question I asked about um, what, how should I say this now, generates homosexuality for the lack of a better term, right? This is a serious matter, and I really think we are oversimplifying it as a church, especially in the Caribbean. We don't say in the Caribbean, there is some, there's hostility towards the gay issue, especially in Jamaica, right? We well, they want to tie it down to our macho culture or a holdover from slavery, whatever it is. The fact is, it is here. I want to understand what is it? Because you see, when you say to them that homosexuality is a learned behavior, they counter and they ask you, who taught you to be straight? And it's a good question because we need to understand that there are people out there who, when they see a member of the same sex, the same way I'm attracted to my wife, the same way Mary is attracted to Shadine, right? People, <laughs> all right, you're free to say that. I hope you can give me an answer. There are people out there when, when they see a man as a man, they like a man. And they have not been molested as as as, Dr., um, as Mr. What's his name? As a pastor, they said a while ago. But I'm going to And it also seems to go the other way because you guys know Ray Bolts, the anchor holds. Real boss is a nice Christian man, and all of a sudden, him get up, put off him here, leave him wife, and go marry to a man and say he's tired of pretending. What causes this? Um, we need to confront it. Um, oh, Mr. Uh, um, Martin, I, I'm not sure. Quite uh, clear. <laughs> yeah. uh, I see Crystal is going to respond, and then I see another hand after that. Um, from I see Tara. I mean, yeah, was saying Tara something was also saying something. Well. Um, you know, I'll, I'll let him speak and then I'll say something afterwards. So we'll have Chris, uh, Crystal, then we'll have Tara, then I see Nikain. So we'll have Crystal, Nikain. Tara, then Nikain. Yeah. Okay, it may sound as if we're oversimplifying because I'm quite familiar with the Ray Bull's story. I think he always, um, he, he recognized those homosexual feelings from earlier. So to, as Ron did, you know, the decent thing was to get married. And so he got married. The problem though, is that he had never submitted those feelings to God. So yes. eventually, 
they came mm -hmm. back and he was not able to overcome it. You may, we may think it's oversimplifying, but it is really a sin problem. And that's the issue with rebels. He did not submit, he did not surrender these feelings to God. So when they came back, well, they never left. It wasn't just all of a sudden he decided to drop his wife. These feelings were always there. And because he never learned, I suppose, or he never, whatever it is, but he did not submit himself to God. And that's yeah. what happened. And that's what happens with other gay people. So it's not oversimplification.